Um, all right, well, thank you to all of you out there in Zoom land who are joining us for this. Uh, my name is Margot Irvin and I'm the acquisitions editor for history books here at Stanford University Press. And I am thrilled to be joining together here to celebrate the publication of Rachel Mesh's book, Before Trans, Three Gender Stories from 19th Century France. Uh, it's a wonderful triptych of three French writers who push the boundaries of gender expression in their own time and provides a really rich canvas for exploring how we think and talk about gender history and trans history today. So thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I just wanna say, Rachel, it has been such a pleasure working with you and seeing this book over the finish line. And now this is the fun part where we get to see the book out in the world and what kinds of conversations it generates. Um, Today, we're also joined by Jack Halberstam, and thank you, Jack, for agreeing to be in conversation with Rachel. So before we dive into it, let me just give a quick rundown of how today's event is going to work. So uh, we're planning to take about an hour, and first, Rachel will give a brief introduction of the book, then we'll have Rachel and Jack in conversation, and we will leave about 15 minutes at the end for Rachel and Jack to take questions. Uh, during the course of the event, there is the opportunity for you to begin to pose questions for the Q&A portion. And so you should see at the bottom of your screen uh, Q&A options. So you can submit questions through there, and then we will be directing them to Rachel and Jack at the end. I do want to just remind everyone that this is being recorded, and when it comes to the Q&A, we want this to be a generative di discussion sticking to the main topics of the book. So before Rachel and Jack launch into it, I'd just like to read a couple of brief introductions. Rachel Mesh is professor of French and English at Yeshiva University in New York, where she also chairs the English department and is just completing a six-year term as an associate editor of 19th century French studies. She is the author of two previous books, Having It All in the Belle Epoque, How French Women's Magazine in Magazines Invented the Modern Woman, published by Stanford Press in 2013, and The Hysterics Revenge, French Women Writers at the Fin de Siècle, published by Vanderbilt University Press in 2006. Her writing has also appeared in Slate, Lilith, Tablet, and the LA Review of Books. And she was awarded a public scholar fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities to complete before trans. Our interlocutor, Jack Halperstam, is professor of gender studies and English at Columbia University. Halberstam is the author of seven books, including Skin Shows, Gothic Horror and the Technology of Monsters, Female Masculinity, the Queer Art of Failure, all those from Duke University Press, In a Queer Time and Place from NYU Press, Gaga Feminism, Sex, Gender, and the End of Normal from Beacon Press, and a short book entitled Trans, A Quick and Quirky Account of Gender Variance from the University of California Press. Halberstam's latest book forthcoming this fall from Duke University Press is entitled Wild Things, The Disorder of Desire. Places Journal awarded Halberstam its Arcus Places Prize in 2018 for innovative public scholarship on the relationship between gender, sexuality, and the built environment. And Halberstam is now finishing a second volume on wildness entitled The Wild Beyond, Music, Architecture, and Anarchy. Rachel, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone at Stanford for making this happen, Margo. Um, and Stephanie Adams, Kendra Scheinert, and um, the whole team, um, as well as to thank you officially and formally for bringing this book into, um, into life and doing such a beautiful job. It is actually quite beautiful to look at, so shout out to the production and art department as well. Um, and of course, I wanna thank Jack for being such a willing interlocutor today. It's really an honor to get to have this conversation with you. And thank you to all of you for enduring yet another Zoom. Um, it's seven o'clock here in New York, so I just have to mention that I just heard out my window the 7 p.m. cheering for all the helpers um, during this time. And, um, and I just wanted to sort of acknowledge that as we take this um, refuge in, um, in history and in, um, in, in all our intellectual pursuits here. Um, so I wanna just give you a brief brief overview of the book so that we really have a, a sense of a, a starting point here for the conversation that will follow. The book is three linked biographies um, of three 19th century French writers who I feel have been misunderstood in their time and in modern scholarship because they didn't neatly fit into the frameworks we tend to use 
to understand women who disobeyed or who didn't conform to 19th century notions of femininity by doing things like wearing pants, for example. So I'm offering here uh, a new way of looking at these figures by using the modern trans framework, which I believe allows us to better understand them, in particular, to see that their refusal to behave in certain expected ways wasn't in order to reject patriarchal structures, which is kind of the traditional um, way in which they've been seen in, um, and sort of through a kind of feminist lens, um, but rather what they were rejecting was the gender binary, and in some cases, the category of woman itself. So in telling the story of or the stories of these three lives, that of Jane de la Foy, Rachilde, and Marthe Montifou, um, I hope to offer a framework for an inclusive trans history that stretches back to before there was a way to talk about it as such. And it was something that has been difficult to do to write that trans history without the language in which to do so. And so really as much as this book is about before trans as the title indicates, it's also about before gender, right? Before there was a way to distinguish in language between bodies that are male and female um, and the way, um, or between biology really, and the way a given person decides to express themselves. Um, and so what the book demonstrates is that long before there was the complex discourse around gender that we have today, all these different ways of thinking about it and talking about it, there were people who experienced their gender in complex ways. And in that sense, it, it offers, I hope, an important context for a set of questions that have often been mistakenly perceived as new when what, I, what I'm arguing is that it's simply the language that we have to talk about it that's new and not the questions that eventually allowed that language to emerge. The book is also not trying to insert 19th century figures into modern categories exactly. It's not about saying that Rachel or Montifo were, were this or that. Um, it's about shifting the questions that we're asking so that we can understand and hear their stories better. And what I'm showing is that using trans as a lens reframes the discussion and allows us to recognize the nature and the stakes, the drive behind the stories they were trying to tell, um, as well as their life stories in a different light. And I, I throw out this definition of transgender, not because I think um, we need that exactly, but to sort of to, to show that I mean it in the most expansive terms. Um, and um, and to come back to the question of the stories they're trying to tell, this brings me to another kind of big framing of my book, which is the notion of the gender story. When you don't have a word to describe yourself, um, you can come up with a story instead. In some ways, our identities are precisely that. They're the stories that we tell about ourselves. Um, stories allow depth and narrative in place of labels that can be fixed and, and flattening, right? Um, and that's what I'm really following in each of these biographies, the way in which these writers, each of whom wrote reams and reams of stories, they were sort of, um, they were born storytellers and they wrote almost, some of them almost compulsively. Um, and I'm looking at, and they weren't just stories, right? They're, it's fiction, but essays, all kinds of different forms of writing and other forms of art, artistic ex expressions, in some cases, photography actually, in the case of Jules Lafoy. Um, but I'm looking at the, primarily the way they made sense of themselves through their writing and how they work to settle themselves into narrative and, and adapted those narratives over time. And I really think that in some ways, these stories were life-saving for them. They were certainly life-determining and life-affirming. They allowed them to understand themselves. And they gave them what Rashield called freedom through imagination, which is a kind of another uh, sort of prevailing frame of, of the book. And so it's very much a book about writers and about writing. But it's also a book about history and culture because it's about this taking place in a particular place and time. Um, grappling, these three figures grappling, grappling with the stories that were being told about gender in the world around them. And in this sense, it's not so far from the way things kind of happen today, right? If you were um, exploring your, your gender identity, you may be doing so um, in the context of a culture that is telling all kinds of stories about gender identity in film, in television, in the media, um, and all kinds of other ways. And you're sort of, there's this kind of internal and external thing that's happening together. And that's kind of what I'm tracing with these three biographies, the ways in which this is the age of, um, of the mass press, 
in 19th century France, and it's a time when gender roles are being discussed all the time in all kinds of stories, in fiction, in visual culture, in art, in photography, um, and in certainly in, in newspapers. And so the book is about that. It's about what it meant to be gender variant in a particular time and place, and how these three figures who were in some ways um, very different from each other um, took these different approaches, interacted with that culture in different ways, relied and, um, and engaged with different narratives around gender that were circulating at the time. I do wanna mention a, a quick word on pronouns at the outset, which is that I chose to stick with the female pronouns in this historical work, um, which is how they were primarily known in their lives. Um, and it was a way to sort of preserve the distinction between their sense of self and the language that was available at the time through which to express themselves. I did this knowing that they had, had they lived today, they might have chosen different pronouns and in all likelihood the three of them would have different pronouns from each other. Um, but in, in part for that reason, I didn't feel like I could make that choice for them. Um, I also recognize that it's complicated, that there's a bigger conversation to be had that is happening at the, now actually in scholarship. And I really hope that this book can con contribute to that conversation in some way. So I just wanna give you um, a quick glimpse. I could literally talk about this all day and all night, um, but, uh, but I'll just give you a quick snippet. I guess that's what, what the book is for. Um, hopefully this will pique your interest further and pro uh, provide a basis for our conversation. So our, my first writer is um, Jane de la Foy, and each section, that's a three-part book, each biography is sort of has a title that refers broadly to their gender story. Um, and so masculinity for God and, and, and country, de la Foy rose to battle alongside her husband Marcel during the Franco-Prussian War, which broke out just a few months after they were married. And this was the first time that she wore pants. That's the, 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 the painting um, on the left side. Um, she resumed that practice when she accompanied Marcel to the Middle East and specifically to the um, ancient city of Susa, which they excavated as part of an archaeological mission for, sponsored by the French government. The mission was wildly successful, um, witness the uh, tons of artifacts that they brought back that you can still view in the Salle du la Foi, the du, du la Foi rooms in the Louvre to this day. Um, and she became a kind of celebrity as you see in this uh, um, trading card of her as a famous explorer series. Um, but the other side of, of, of um, du la Foi that I tell in, this, in the book is the way in which she explored herself um, and her identity in part through novels in which girls become boys and really sort of grapple with this fraught transition that's deeply psychological and, and extremely fascinating. Um, and she also, in her archives, had a series of unpublished biographies that she worked on with her husband of gender crossers over time. Okay, so um, second writer is Rachild, and Rachild is probably the best known among French scholars, at least, who have embraced her in the past 20, 30 years as a rebel, savvy, self-promoter, certain kind of feminist. She's been seen, and I have kind of struggled with this framework as well in, in previous writing, um, despite her having written a treatise called Why I'm Not a Feminist. And the answer to that question really was very simple. She didn't see herself as a woman. Um, she saw herself instead, she, took, she, she, didn't, she explored many different ways of seeing herself throughout her writing, and she took on many different um, avatars including late in life, um, she would refer to herself as a werewolf and she has all kinds of books that involve cats and wolves and, um, and various transformations. People often, when she said things like, I'm a werewolf, I'm not a woman, they thought she was being facetious or provocative. And what I'm arguing is that she was also actually being direct. Um, and people sort of couldn't understand what she was trying to tell them. Um, and eventually that title, To Be Strange or Nothing at All, was her way of when she launched herself, her career truly took off with her book, Monsieur Venus in the 1880s, um, which was quite controversial. And she kind of embraced the identity that it created um, to be strange or nothing at all, because it was a kind of space in which she could, didn't really have to choose to be one thing or another. She could simply be a shield. And then the last writer is Marc de Montifou, who started her career as a, an art critic um, and is known in scholarship for, primarily for that reason to this day. Um, but she comes into the public eye when she starts writing erotic versions of Christian histories. 
um, which uh, led to her with several prison sentences, which she would avoid by negotiating to stay in an asylum instead or running off to Belgium. Um, and people kept saying, well, just stop writing the stories and you'll stop getting thrown in jail. Um, but she wouldn't. She was very insistent that she couldn't just do what she wanted to do, be what she wanted to be. She continued to write her por pornographies, no matter the consequences. And that's that I am me, je suis moi. She refused to define herself to try to, to feel that she had to explain herself to the public. She believed deeply in the right to difference, the right to be herself. And she identified with many writers over time who were also perceived as different, including the Abbé de Choisy, which is one of the figures that Du Lafoy also wrote about. So I think that's another thread here, which is the way in which these figures look to history to try to find um, an understanding of, of themselves. And so um, just to wrap up, um, I just wanted to say that I'm incredibly grateful to be able to share their stories with you here today, however, virtually, and there's so much more um, I have to say about them. You'll just, I guess, have to buy the book um, if you're still not satisfied at the end of this conversation. It has, by the way, over 60 images, um, which was, um, which looks fabulous, I think. And, um, and that my goal here in this work was to widen the lens through which we can think about the past in the hopes that not only we'll be able to recognize what I like to call the non-binary 19th century, but that by doing so, we open up this field to a more diverse group of scholars, readers, and thinkers who are able to, like Jules Lafoy and Montifou did with their writings, find comfort in recognizing their place in history. Um, and so I am thrilled to be able to talk to Jack Halberstam about some of these questions. As Jack, your thinking and framing and extraordinary writing has so influenced my own. Um, and with that, um, let's get to the conversation. I think he needs to be unmuted. Okay, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, but <laughs> no. I could. Okay, so first of all, Rachel, um, you know, Thank you for this extraordinary book. It's fantastic to be in conversation. Um, you know, as soon as I read this book, I had so many questions for you. And so I'm very, very excited that we're able to uh, go over some of the details of this rich material that, as you said, it's not a discovery project. It's a project about epistemologies and classifications, um, but also about the complexity of self-styling at certain moments that we have simply cast as prior to contemporary arrangements that we understand. So there's, there's lots of information in the book. There are a lot of different areas that we might touch on. I thought maybe we could just get into a conversation by my asking you about the pants permit that yeah. each of these people successfully applied for except maybe, maybe Rashield didn't. Um, no, yeah, didn't. but so this was a, this was a, a, a permit that um, women who wanted to dress in men's clothing had to apply for at that time. And each person in your genealogy use it differently. And I just wanted to invite you to begin with that. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, that, um, it, we don't have all, all the records of it, um, but we know that they did we have more information about Rachel than she had to actually apply twice for it, but she did somehow manage to get it. You were supposed to have a medical reason for it, um, but um, we don't have any records of what the medical reasons supplied were. Um, and so we don't, we don't have all the details, um, but we know that, um, that, and I think Judith Wa probably acquired hers um, just by kind of having access. She was in, um, you know, she had, she was in a kind of, it's hard to overstate what it meant to be a successful Orientalist at the end of the 19th century. Yeah. So she, you know, whatever she wanted, she had brought back palaces from Persia. She could do whatever she wanted. Um, but um, we find, and there's a moment with Montifo where you realize what this means for her, which I found very poignant, um, where she has an exchange through an intermediary about the pants permit saying, is it okay? I don't have the physical piece of paper. And this man asks on her behalf. Um, and you start to realize 
you know, the bold, you know, seemingly audacious Montifo who was sort of willing to fight with anyone and say anything. This was in her archives, kind of her very politely. Yes, he says you don't need to have the official paper. It's fine. You can go to this event. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there was definitely sort of that that legal threat in the background. And it's not like there were that many people who um, who who had this this pants permit. Um, you know, it's not it's not we're not you know in about many years it's going to be obsolete because people like Colette and others are um, prancing about and breaking all the rules. Um, but this is a kind of in between time where um, it's, it, it's sort of unclear legally what their, their status is. And in, in sort of in terms of the historical framing, this is why you often find these writers in a list together and how they kind of related to each other because they, um, they sort of knew of each other as the other person who wears pants. Sometimes they'd be confused for each other actually um, in the press. And so again, like you said, it wasn't like I discovered that they were wearing pants and there was a pants permit, but my question was, Right. What does this mean? Does this somehow join them together as the same? And what, you know, what is it? I sort of resisted that um, because the primary framework for that was a kind of feminist, like, let's put all the pants wear wears together. Um, and it's just one detail and they each interacted with it in, in, in sort of very different ways. And it meant something different for them. I mean, Rashid stops wearing pants right. at a certain point. Right. Right, but what it does do, and this comes back around in, you know, the work of someone like Radcliffe Hall, it shows how crucial clothing is at that time to the project of self-making. And that might be, you know, it's not like clothing isn't important now, but if you think about the fact that there isn't surgery available, there isn't sex reassignment surgery, and there isn't the whole architecture of, gender and sexual definition that's available now to be used, clothing, it seems to me, takes on a really different uh, weight. And you spend quite a bit of time in the book that uh, De La Foy wears trousers. There's also the fact that she dresses almost identically at times to her husband, right? And so there's a kind of uh, a, a reframing even of the heterosexual relationship as in this case fraternal rather than made up of a sort of you know sexual and gendered complementarity so it, it felt to me like the the pants permit was important because it was a sort of a gateway onto both an older system of sumptuary laws and a newer system of self-fashioning that absolutely that yeah absolutely um and the, it it also like it shows that they tried they had to go through the effort of doing it, right? It wasn't just, no one just, you know, it boldly decides to do this to be provocative. Um, it shows that, that there was some other operating force. And I think that actually part of them getting it had to do with this, there was a sort of recognition that, well, some people just kind of have to wear pants. Um, and that yeah. seems to be, you know, the way that they inhabited their personas, people, in the case of, of De La Foy and Montifu, it sort of seemed to take it like, oh, oh, okay, I get it. That, you know, I can't explain it, but that seems to be what, what, what's happening. Um, and you and you have this incredible photographic record. So for Montifu, you really, as you saw on that slide, you really just see her transition and it, it overlaps in her life with her kind of taking a different kind of ease. Um, and that once she can dress in men's clothing and sort of realizes like, oh, she settles into that and she stops getting in quite as many fights and getting sent to prison as often, interestingly enough. It, you know, the, the story that you give about uh, Dulafoy who, uh, you know, gets a pants permit because basically she's a big old orientalist and she's going off and, um, you know, digging up relics and pulling, bringing them back to France and, and, and so on, raises um, the question about the political orientation of these uh, figures. And while there's a tendency to expect that people who are in open rebellion against the gender norms of their environment and their culture might hold other kinds of politically uh, experimental uh, views, this is actually not the case. Um, I mean, it's certainly not the case with Jules Lafoy. It's not really even the case with the other two. What we have are three highly privileged uh, figures 
who are used to their culture sort of bending around them at some point, um, but who nonetheless have this, uh, you know, have a site where they want to make kind of, uh, perform a kind of refusal. So how do you, how did you deal with the, the contrary politics that swirl around these figures when writing a book like this? Well, I thought that was a really important part of it, right? To read Du La Foi with Rashield yeah. is kind of a, a shocking thing, right? And originally the book, I, I hadn't gotten into the Montefiore research. And so I really just had those two sort of against each other to sort of show how these two people living in pretty much the exact same time, at least at the outset of Rashield's career, she lives till 1953. So she goes on for quite some time um, and writes to her very last day. Um, but I wanted to see how, well, I was struck by how they were really, um, grappling with different narratives. For Dieu la Foi, she was a religious Catholic. She was super conservative. She did not want to rock any boats. Um, and she wanted to find herself in, in Catholic history. I mean, she writes this kind of Joan of Arc story where she's basically Joan of Arc. So she, she rather remarkably kind of finds her way and recognizes herself in these dominant, super um, traditional narratives. That's the kind of forgotten and, and country bit. Um, while um, Rashield is traditionally seen as this kind of rebel who was doing this kind of savvy self-promotion to sell books and to make a ruckus. And I just really, I think, you know, it's kind of a question about rebellion, right? And what that means. I think that it's often about something else. And that this goes back to my, to what I was saying about language and story, right? So much of their behaviors are about not having other words and ways of expressing themselves or direct ways to express themselves. So to rebel, quote unquote, in this way, by dressing in a certain way and being provocative wasn't necessarily to provoke someone else. It's a mode of expression and of self-expression. Um, and you can see that in a difference between Dieu la Foi sort of doing the same thing, but it's not provocative, clearly not provocative because of all these other political ways that she aligns. Well, Rashield is just seen as doing it, you know, um, to be obnoxious. And she's kind of keeps directly saying, you know, that this is who I am. And you see, one of the things I wanted to recover with Rashield, who has been studied, um, you know, kind of through these different modern lenses, is this vulnerability that I saw in her writing. Mm -hmm. I just saw, I saw a lot of struggling. I saw a lot of pain. Um, and understanding this around these questions of gender that she was working out and this inability to be seen and to sort of find her way in language um, helps bring out that vulnerability that is mostly sort of ignored by scholarship. And we sort of skip those parts of the novel because we don't really understand what to do with them. There's so many other, you know, tantalizing interludes. Um, but I think if you, when you see those things together, you, you realize, um, and she repeats, she comes back to them. She struggled with depression. If reading that, those stories against some of her personal letters, um, the resonances were, were, were very strong. And so there's these very different kinds of rebellion. And then for Montifo, um, it's similar in the sense that, I mean, I tell this story about the slap in the, in the book where she is so angry at the way the newspaper has portrayed her in this supposedly fictional story. She takes the newspaper, goes to the opera premiere, you know, uh, follows the editor who doesn't realize who she is because she is only recently, she's basically, this is the first time she's come out in men's clothing. And she slaps him across the face um, with the offending newspaper and he's completely caught unawares. And I really see that slap as a kind of coming out moment for her, right? Her anger was about this inability to, um, to translate herself into words in other ways. And she didn't want to, she didn't want to have to. She just, that was the I am me. Can't you just take it as that? Right. We, you know, the I am me is tricky, isn't it? Because it could just be read as a sort of uh, statement of self-possession and, and the beginnings of a kind of liberal articulation of, oh, you know, categories are not important to me. I am who I am sort of thing. Um, but I, so for that reason, I guess I want to I want to pull back a little bit and ask then about how the contrary gender expressions of these figures. And I, I really do, I personally hesitate to call them women, you know, except maybe with the case of Rashield, who 
did le live at least half of her life um, in women's clothing as a woman um, and didn't sustain the orientation, the gender orientation that she seems to experiment on. But uh, for both, um, you, you know, Mark and Jane de la Foy, there's, you know, there feel, feels like something that is, is a real commitment to a particular or gender orientation. So that's one thing I, I, I know I really appreciate your commentary on pronouns, but I, want, I, I think we could maybe even revisit that. And you write in the book that they themselves use different pronouns for themselves at different times in their life. So I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. Then the other, the other big question here, of course, is about sexuality, because each one of these people had very particular orientation, and it is not at all the orientation that we've come to expect, which is a masculine woman who then passes as a man and takes a feminine lover. Each one of these people had a husband, two of them uh, gave birth uh, to children, had daughters, uh, not that they had much to do with them, right? Montifo had a daughter that he didn't see. Uh, oh, no, Montifo had a, had a son, actually. Whom whoa, she okay. Oh, right, who he also Mark. called Mark, right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what about this nexus of gender and sexuality? Um, and is that also part of why you wanted to read these three together? Because they share this kind of uh, orientation that is, um, you know, it was a kind of commitment to masculinity on the one hand, but is not um, divorced from heteronormativity on the other, or at least heterosexual. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, there's so much in that question that I want to address. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I don't call them women in the book. I call them yeah. writers, um, but yeah. I use the female pronoun. Um, and I just want to say about Rush Shield, I actually think she's, she's the one who's most clearly doesn't think of herself as a woman. Um, and that the clothes is a confusing thing for us. I, um, I once gave a paper called Rush Shields Pants um, mm -hmm. because I think that people sort of use that, oh, it was experimental and then she moved on, you know, she grew up and she got married. But the biography is much more complicated and nuanced than that. Um, and the clothes is sort of our modern term for saying, oh, this is how we know this is what she was doing. But for her, it didn't have that meaning. She didn't know that was the sort of defining fi uh, feature of gender fluidity or her, you know, trans um, uh, identity. Um, and so she kind of found a style. And if you saw the images, um, which I don't want to pull up because it makes us really tiny on the screen, um, but they're in the book. Um, she had this kind of shape shifting image and her friends always talk about this like there are all these verbal portraits of her there are artistic portraits of her um sort of trying to capture so anyway so my point is just that um i think rashield's identity actually is pretty constant over time um and um and it and the pants is just one phase of that um but she's still profoundly engaged in these issues um for the pronouns Oh my goodness, I lost a lot of sleep over this. And I still think about it, um, you know, because it was partly because I had to, I felt I had to make the same choice for all of them um, or things would get very complicated and it was like more clear that I was making a choice for a particular individual rather than the sort of historical category. And the challenge for me and for us, for historians, for people thinking about um, trans history and this, it, for exactly the, what you're saying about these three, is that what do we call somebody who didn't see themselves as a woman, but was seen as a woman at the time and faced the limitations, the gender limitations that the, those patriarchal structures um, created for that person, um, but maybe today would have taken a different pronoun, right? So there's something about acknowledging that they didn't, sort of lived as women. These are not women who passed as men. You know, they were married to men. They sort of maintained certain seemingly heterosexual norms, um, heteronormative, right, um, structures. Um, and so they kind of faced the patriarchy and were involved sometimes peripherally in feminism and were sort of trying to figure that out for themselves. Um, and that's a separate category from some other kinds of figures that have been the subject of recent um, trans scholarship where it's more clear that they wanted to, they went by male pronouns and it was sort of more consistent. 
Um, so there's, there's that issue. Um, and this sort of historical piece, I mean, I think it's interesting actually how different disciplines are dealing with this now. I'm working on the margins or, you know, the intersection of, of multiple disciplines. Um, and I think that as someone who works with language, um, I, I, I'm sort of extra sensitive to that. Um, and, and then as a historian, I also wanted to preserve the experience of that disjunction. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I, I, I feel it's a wider conversation and it wasn't one that was um, easy to have. It's in, in terms of the other question that you um, raise about them being married to men, I think that this was part of what was very confusing for a uh, shield in particular, and also for du Lafoy, right? We have this understanding, there's a notion of inversion, 19th century idea of homosexuality was sort of sounds transish, right? It's this idea of if you're a, a woman attracted to a woman, it means you're a man in a woman's body, and that's why you're attracted to a woman. And it preserves this kind of heterosexual model. But there's not anyone really talking about um, someone who is, I, I, you know, sees themselves as masculine and is still attracted to men. There's sort of no paradigm out there at the time. And so I think that was part of why, um, you know, I think that that's part of the struggle that they have, like literally not knowing how to, how to see themselves. Montifo um, was married, unclear how happy that relationship was or how mutual it was. Um, and she seems to be, have been attracted to, to it lots of different kinds of people. Um, but the relationship between gender and sexuality is not a clear one. And it's one that I kind of don't make any grand statements about. I'm sort of just following their exploration about of that, those questions in the biographies. And, and you're not saying that, you know, that just, they just lack a vocabulary and if only the vocabulary was yeah. available. I mean, that's the the opportunity to then open out onto the fact that we're looking at a very, very different uh, structure um, within which bodies make sense or don't make sense. And it's, you know, the, the epistemological frame is just wholly different. And that's why some of these questions can't simply be dragged backwards from the 20th century and applied willy-nilly across uh, these kinds of scenes. So, which is something that I appreciate, but I also appreciate the way that in their writings, you show, you know, in whether it's the novels of uh, De La Foy or um, the writings, uh, the, the, you know, very, very uh, often seen as pornographic writings of Rashid, they're looking for different kinds of languages to express a difference which occupies a different space in that society. And I feel like the, the book is very successful at holding on to both an explanatory frame on the one hand, but also maintaining a level of complexity that doesn't allow this to just slip into these people simply were waiting for the categories to come into focus so they could enter into them. Um, and of course they were not the only figures at that time. And you do mention, for example, Colette's lover, uh, Missy, uh, Mathilde Massy, is that the, was that? Um, the I knew her as the Marquise de Bellebeuf and she was ah, yeah. right, called uh, Missy, yeah. Yeah, and she, she you know, was the, the very masculine uh, lover of Colette at one time. Um, there were many such figures and though and yet those figures were not clustered in the way that we tend to cluster identities um and so on um so i i guess moving on from there because i'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you about this later we can come back to it um in the little bit of time that we have left before we go to some of these q a um opportunities the i wanted to ask you two things one about the image base because you you're a really great um reader of images you you know on the one hand you do give us the plots of these crazy novels but on the other hand you spend a lot of time thinking about the way in which these figures pose themselves in the image and the thinking about the images together and um and as you say there are over 65 images in the book so I wanted to, one, know about the image, and then that opens onto my final question, which is about the research process. And you tell, uh, you know, at the end, you tell this, this uh, beautiful story about um, visiting Jane de la Foy's house at the end of your 
research and about the kind of cover story that you often had to give when you were dealing with librarians and um, uh, archivists. If you had just said you were looking into their sexual and gender practices, you need to information from the archives. So one, the image base, to, you know, how do you find all these images and um, tell us a little bit about your process of working with the images and then to the research in general and the kind of cover story that you yourself had to produce in order to get access to the materials you needed. Um, yes. Oh, again, so many, so many possible directions there. Um, um, so um, I, I, I guess I, I started working with images a lot in my previous book, um, which also had uh, a ton of images in it. And um, and I mean, there these three have pretty incredible archives. So um, so most of those images were there. Um, in the archives. I think that what the difference is that people haven't been interested in the images or haven't looked to them um, for the layers of meaning. And that's something that I've gotten from my art historian colleagues um, and really had a lot of fun with in my previous work, just kind of unpacking the images. You know, I did semiotics at Yale in the 90s, so I learned that everything is a text and kind of all comes together um, here. Um, and, um, and in particular, the Images of, of Rashield kind of surprised me because I didn't real they didn't they didn't conform to my you know pre-existing notions of what sort of trans should look like in the 19th century in ways that Multifo and, and Jolafoy kind of strikingly do. Um, but when I started looking at the multiple overlapping, similar shape-shifting images of her, I was really um, kind of pleasantly surprised towards the end of the research about how much there was to say there, how um, how interesting that the the impulse to capture her. Um, what she looked like, even though there's, there are very few photographs. Um, and so, um, you know, that it, it is really helpful having that photographic record. And Julia Foy was a photographer. Yeah. She was the one who took photographs during their mission um, to Persia and her, you know, I, I have fantasies about the, the Netflix version of her life story. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, and so um, she clearly, like in some of them, and you could see this in the Montefo pictures too, they took pleasure in being photographed. And that's something I think that um, can sort of understand that desire to be seen, literally. And there was a way in which the photograph could kind of capture that um, in ways that we have sort of the, more of the tools to, to appreciate. Um, in terms of the, the cover stories, uh, I felt sort of self-conscious about that. I mean, Marcel Dulafoy was a member of the Académie Française. For, for the non-French scholars among us, that is the most conservative institution James possible. Husband, that is. What? James, James' husband, Marcel. James' husband, Marcel. Yeah. Um, and so her archives are there in the library that's connected to the Académie Française. And I managed to get permission. When you're elected to the Ac Académie Française, you become an immortal. And to go to the library, you need permission from, a, from an immortal, which you can do by writing to someone. And so I managed to get permission by saying I was writing on, and I thought actually I was writing on French women writers, um, actually at the beginning of this project. Um, and that is another point that I would make is that, you know, people say, well, how did you choose these three? It's not that I chose them. I started working on Du Lafoy, who had appeared in my book on French women's magazines. Um, which were these hyper-feminized publications. And then there was Je La Foi in her suits. And so I sort of like, I don't know what to do with that, but I'm going to come back to that, you know, later on. And that's sort of how I went down this path. And I was really just listening to the stories that, um, that she was telling. I wasn't, I didn't have the idea of, oh, let me write a book about trans in the 19th century. Um, far from it. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so I, ha I kind of, I mean, even when I was applying for permission, I'm a little bit nervous when I send the libraries, you have to s agree to send them a copy of the book at the end. Once you've acquired the permission to use these photos that they're gonna <laughs> say, wait, was this was the title? Did she, uh, what happened here? But by then it'll be too late. Um, and I felt sort of self-conscious about that, um, you know, and, and sort of guilty that I could I could do that or that I was, I was couching it in that way um, in order to, to get to these materials. But it was, it was kind of subversive to go into the, the archives of the Académie Française, Bibliothèque de l'Institut, 
um, you know, in the copula and secretly be looking at these dossiers of, of, of Jane de la Foy. Um, mm. People had no idea what I was up to. All right, I think uh, probably we should stop for the Q&A. Um, I just want to note that uh, I hope somebody asked about feminism because that's an important part of this. If you want to moderate. I think Margot may need to be unmuted by whoever's running it. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks for this great discussion so far. Um, and we do actually have one question around them first. Um, and this question is from Elzar Kraus. To what extent would these women relate to the idea of feminism specifically? What did Rashield mean when she wrote, I am not a feminist? Um, great. Um, that question is from a student of mine, so I'm very happy to answer. Um, um, yeah, so the feminist question, and as Jack noted in a previous conversation with me, it seems to kind of haunt all three of these figures. And when, when, when Rashield says that, she's really irritated. People start asking her, as soon as feminism, so feminism becomes a thing. The word feminism comes from France in the 18, late 1880s, I believe. Um, and it doesn't quite mean what we think of it today. It's associated with, um, with eventually with suffrage, with kind of welfare reform, certain rights and, and laws. It's not associated with, um, you know, the personal political or any of those kinds of things, but it is a burgeoning movement in France. Um, and it is one that none of these writers particularly wanted to be associated with, but that they were often grouped into. And so Rashield in particular is irritated by this. I, there's a letter in her archives where she's basically saying, why are you asking me to write about this? Why, 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 why you know, why do you think I care about this? And later in, a, in Why I'm Not a Feminist, she makes that more clear. She talks about uh, her decision to, to start wearing pants, her hair short, um, and this kind of idea of freedom through imagination. And, um, you know, and, the, and really she, the answer that she offers to that, she tells the story of, um, of being asked at a dinner party and it's written in the 1920s. So it's much later um, than the period that most of these stories are located in. Um, but she is just a, a irritated by it. It doesn't want to be set in this category. And the answer, as I said before, was because I'm not a woman, right? I think it was, another way, a kind of another misrecognition of feminism. Now, this, I think the other question that Jack was getting at, that this is super complicated because we only know about these women because of feminism. I'm only writing about them because of feminism, because I study feminism in this period. I study women writers in this period. And I'd often encounter these writers who were often described, especially Rashield, as resisting quote unquote categorization. Um, and, um, and there was this kind of effort. What happens with the label, if it's applied too broadly, is that anything that a woman does, if she's considered a woman, is considered feminism. Any act that doesn't seem to conform is feminism. Um, and it's a kind of flattening that happens. Um, and that's just not the driving impulse of these stories, right? But it does overlap with feminism. And as I was saying before, it overlaps in the sense that these are people who were treated as women. They couldn't vote, right? They were subject to all kinds of strictures as women. Um, so it's not separate. And so kind of inviting a more intersectional history here um, because we shouldn't just think about Rashield and Jules Foy and Montifou in the context of other women. Look at those histories. They were identifying every single one of them with gender crossers who were more what we would call trans feminine. Right? Those are the pe people that they identified with. If they wanted to be feminist, they could have joined the feminist movement. Jeanne Foy goes through all kinds of contortions to try to understand what kind of feminist she is and the kind she comes up with is the Joan of Arc kind. So, you know, it's a little conflict who doesn't exist in modern history, but women will travel back in time and, and fight more wars. Um, but, um, but I think that's like a key point there. It's that that's not the only pool through which to understand them. And so what this lens does is that it, it opens up a new set of questions. It asks us to look at them differently and to go back to what Jack was saying about not wanting to use the language. It's not that 2020, you know, 21st century British language that now rescues us and everything is fine. It's the thing that links past to present is the challenge of fitting yourself into language. 
right? That is why we're still having debates about pronouns today. Um, because it's the same challenge. And that's, you know, it's not the resolution of the challenge. Understanding that helps us to look at what was at stake for these writers. And that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't that I was the first person to see that Judafwa wins, but I'm one of the first people to say, well, what is that all about? There's something bigger going on there. That's not the end of a sentence, that's the beginning of a book. Um, and that's, you know, and that, that's sort of what I, the, the opening that I want to, to make in, in tr introducing that category and saying, there's no reason to assume um, anything about anyone in the 19th century. And so here's another set of questions that you can bring to bear. And I don't know what the answer is. I don't want people to go around saying like, oh, so does that mean George Sand is, is trans? No, you're not, I'm not asking you to just tack a label on things, but maybe that lens helps us understand some of the things she was working out in her life. I'm not saying I haven't gone down that road, um, but it, right, it's a question, it's not, it's not an answer. Oops, <laughs> I'm the only one who's allowed to talk apparently. <laughs> we have to unmute whoever is there doing that. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so we have a lot of great questions here and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so I'm actually gonna group these next two questions together. Uh, one from Joshua Trannon uh, saying, I would be interested to hear Dr. Messer's thoughts on the relationship between de la Foy and imperial masculinity. And we have another question from Colin Foss asking, I'm wondering how de la Foy navigated not just French culture, but also Middle Eastern cultures. How did going to what she called the Orient change or not change her gender story? Um, okay, great. Um, those were, uh, the, the Orientalism thread, I actually have an article coming out in an issue of Yale French Studies on photography and the body that's forthcoming next year, kind of deals with this question um, more specifically of the Orientalism and the photography in Jodafwa. And her photographic archive is incredible, by the way. Um, she keeps a travelogue when she's in Persia. And this is how she sort of discovers that she's a writer. And it's published in the Tour du Monde travel journal. And that's right. You couldn't like go on the internet and, and see foreign places. This is, the, this is the way that people experience the world um, in the 19th century. And, um, and what I found precisely by doing this, right, by taking this framework um, and opening up to this thousand page travelogue that is kind of tedious and hard to get through, um, I realized that there was this thing that was going on in between the lines, which was her the unfolding of her gender story. Um, not explicitly, but in her sort of engagement with Persian gender roles um, and how to see herself and how she wanted to be seen as a kind of hero on this journey. Um, and so the, the travel experience was fundamental. It was this kind of gender departure, right? She literally had to go thousands of miles away, kind of have the freedom to be a, a, a French man in a sense. Um, and she managed to do it by, she kind of convinced people, well, I can't very well go around in a veil and that's what you know Persian women have to do. So I guess you're gonna have to let me just wear pants and, and don't let anyone know that I'm a woman. Um, and it was, it was a really important moment in her, in her story. It was the turning point really in her story. She returns to this practice she had taken up in the Franco-Prussian War, which was a really edifying experience. And she kind of decides that she's a hero. Um, she wants, she fully embraces um, the discourse of Orientalism, the discourse of mastery and control. And by fully identifying with that, she becomes a kind of French man. Um, it kind of allows her to experience that. And when she returns, that is how she's perceived. Um, unproblematically, you know, sort of fully supporting the patriarchy through that. And so, um, you know, people sort of look at her travelogues and try to see what's going on with the women and assuming that she's in the harem and doing interesting things. But actually, she's trying to mimic the discourse of imperial masculinity. She's sort of taking that on um, as a way of being. And then, and, and that in the end kind of gives her permission to be herself because she does it so successfully successfully sort of takes up these cliches in such a su successful way um, that um, that she returns a hero and no one was going to argue with that in the end and then she's always sort of um, using that as her reasoning when people say well why does Madame de la Foy wear pants after all this is very strange um, well Persia 
and Franco-Prussian War, you know, no matter that she was in the beautifully tailored suits at the time. Um, and she would always apparently be telling stories about Persia and, and these fancy dinner parties and that as a sort of reminder of, you know, this is, this is why, this is why this is happening. Remember who I am. Yeah. Longo, yeah. can I do a question in the Q&A from uh, Tamara Chaplin? Um, the, the one about the Sapphic cabarets, can you see that one? Uh, I don't know that I can, but if you can, go, so, go for uh, it. It's a really, it, it opens onto a really good question. Maybe you know uh, Tamara, I'm not sure, uh, Rachel. No. She's a French historian at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And she says, we know that uh, Rachild frequented the Sapphic cabarets that were extant in Paris during the 30s and 40s, cabarets run by women like Sidonie Baba and Suzy Soledor. So to push a bit harder, Rachel, on your portrayal of these women as living within a heteronormative frame, to what extent did these people's performances of gender and sexuality change over the course of their lives? Did these changes then reflect historical changes and the emergence of queer worlds? I feel like that's great. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yes, and that is also what I wanted to account for in the biographies, that these are shifting narratives. Some of them become more stable, as in the case of Jules Lafoy, and some, um, and with Rashield, who, as I mentioned, writes and writes until the very end, she kind of try, she, she kind of explores every kind of um, modern queer trans identity. It's kind of remarkable. Um, she, um, she, despite her being in a, in a marriage with a man, she was not particularly heteronormative and she was very, not, very much not in love with her husband, um, who was apparently quite the bore. Um, and, um, and so she hangs out, she has a kind of coterie of gay men who she hangs out with, um, young men, um, who, and she writes about this in some of her later works. And so one of the things I would love to see with Rashield, I mean, I could have, I kind of could have written a whole book about, um, just about Rashield actually, um, is that we tend to stop the story after the pants wearing and there's just, there's so much more work to be done. She was extremely influential. She and her husband revived the Mercure de France journal. She was the literary editor. People wrote to her begging for her to read their, their stuff. So as a, just as a writer, she was incredibly influential. And, um, and yes, the, um, she is kind of, she's kind of everywhere um, in, you know, in the, in the, in the 20th century up until the very end. Um, and so, yeah, the questioner is absolutely right to, to, to bring that up. It's an ongoing, I can't, you know, I don't sort of tell the full story, but I give some glimpses into that up until the werewolf days of later on. But I think that was part of the well, werewolf, the sapphic um, werewolf persona could perhaps um, overlap. And she, she identified with people who were different, right? Who didn't sort of fit in, whether that was lesbians, um, gay men, other kinds. Yeah gender bending. Hmm? Werewolves. Werewolves, exactly. And that's what I mean by she just sort of tried out these different av avatars um, throughout. And there's just, there's so much more to be explored there. I mean, she wrote like, I don't know, 90 novels or nine, not, not, they weren't all novels, but it she wrote, she published basically every time, right, Rachel? She lived 93 years. And this is what the question is like, wow, you know, here's somebody who begins by asking for a pants permit in <sighs> late 19th century France, and then is basically at the height of that sort of sapphic cabaret culture in Paris is in the bars in the 1930s and 40s. So this, this is, uh, you know, sort of gives you the opportunity to think about change over the course of a lifetime. Absolutely. And promises many, many seasons on Netflix. <laughs> Uh, well, I look forward to that. I wish we had, I'm mindful of the time, I wish we could get to more of these wonderful questions. Um, but I think that we should bring it to a close and I just wanna extend a huge thanks to everybody who was able to attend this today. Thank you, Rachel, so much for writing this book and Jack, thank you so much for joining us for this great discussion. Uh, one last thing, I do just wanna remind everybody that if you haven't already ordered a copy of the book, you can do through uh, you can do so through the Stanford Press website, and we actually have a special discount code for this event for $5 off and free shipping. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have been recording this conversation, which will be available through our various social media channels. Um, yeah, so once again, all of us at Stanford are so excited to have this book out in the world. 
And thanks to everyone for joining us. Stay well. I hope you all love this book as much as I do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Margot. All right. Cheers. <laughs>